So, little fun story. Uh, this morning, actually, got into the wrong conference. Got into the JavaScript one. Just told them I was a speaker. They gave me a little bracelet. We go through. They give us the free swag. Got a free cap to go with it. And we keep going. It's like, God, no, nobody in here. Just keep moving on, moving on. It's, yeah, where is anyone I know? No idea. And then we try to get onto the network. It's like, I don't see the airline conference network here. And that's when I realized I was in the wrong conference. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm not leaving for JavaScript. Uh, I'm staying here, which I, I think is a good thing. Uh, yeah, uh, as Garrett mentioned, I do work at Heroku. And one of the interesting things about Heroku is that we have very critical components written in Erlang that are uh, living in the production stack all the time. The other interesting thing in there is that Heroku is mostly a Ruby and now a Go company. Uh, even though Erlang, we have a team of really competent Erlang programmers, we have very critical components in there, it's still mostly Ruby and Go. And so in my time there, I tried a lot to try to convince people to join us onto the Beam Virtual Machine and getting them interested in there. And so I told them about Erlang, which is that very, very cool, fancy uh, virtual machine and environment to build services into. Uh, th th this cool place for services. Uh, you get all the fancy tooling, property-based testing, you've got tracing, you've got all that kind of amazing stuff. You have uh, everything that's, oh, is the video terrible? The video is terrible. It's not getting any better, is it? All right, uh, I have a different adapter in my bag, though. I'm going to try that. Ha, huh. there we go. The adapter is the problem. Come prepared to the wrong conference. Um, <laughs> all right. And so, yes, uh, really about telling them this fantastic stuff we could be having. Uh, great environment again, li live code deploys, all that kind of stuff, great uptime. And they see that and say, yeah, that, that could be really, really interesting. Uh, and they start playing with the language. And the questions they start to ask are going to be about uh, how do I get history in the shell? And then you go and tell them, well, OK, you have to download that component, patch or install. It's going to corrupt its file every three weeks, but that's OK. And then they tell you about, how can I change the keyboard shortcuts in there? And say, you can't. You have to patch the actual library, send that upstream. Just don't bother with that. And they might be asking, uh, which database drivers should I be using? And you're going to tell them, well, I mean, if you're using that database, say Postgres something, there's about 15 of them, and three of them are trying to reduce account, but there's still very, very many of them. And so you, you might get other questions and other questions of that kind. How do I run tests after changing a branch? And back then, uh, especially with the old rebar, you had to uh, rm-rf depths ebin, then go rebar get depths compile, and then rebar ct dash dash skip depths equal true dash r, and tell them to forget about the warnings and everything. And so. What, I, what, what really I sold them was that fancy plane for the future with all the magical uh, tools to make their services. And what they got is that hand crank in there. And what they could think is that the Erlang team within the company is really that bunch of really enthusiastic people, really loving to fly their planes that they have to start by hand. And roughly, that's maybe the state we're in in a lot of things. We're just really, really good at getting everything hand started. Uh, we're still selling this, but we're still experiencing that. And so the tools really that we have, the stuff that makes Erlang shine, you do have the Erlang and OTP model in there. That's the one everyone knows, or most of people know in here. Uh, the concurrency, the everything. You've got property-based testing, which is amazing. You've got three tools to do it, at least. Uh, quick check, proper, and trick. Most other languages that you're going to play it uh, are going to have one of them, maybe, and it's going to be half as good as any of the three we have already. Tracing and production is a thing that I think most people playing with other languages don't even think uh, is a possibility. You don't get to go on a production system and debug it live in most cases. And so that doesn't even come to mind as a feature that is clearly vital. Dialyzer is really good. A lot of people like statically typed language. And without it, they're not very happy. More testing tool, cuter, conqueror, or mind-blowing for a lot of people. 
great stuff. And we have really a crap load of libraries about everything, distributed systems and whatnot. Mostly people don't know about them or uh, not necessarily know how to use them. So this is the Swindon Magic Roundabout. It's a roundabout in UK made out of five smaller roundabouts. Uh, I think this is a kind of good explanation of the airline experience. You want to go on the road and then you get this roadblock of going like, I know how these things work, but there are so many of them at once and really a lot of confusion. And that reminds me of being in college trying to learn about data structures. And uh, we had to do it in C++ at the place I studied at. And a lot of people never had seen the language before. And the interesting bit is that every time they were playing uh, with data structures, they could easily conceptualize linked lists, trees, uh, doubly linked lists. All these simple data structures were easy to conceptualize. But many of the students were having a lot of struggle just getting them implemented because they had the complexity of the language they didn't know to cope with at the same time as they were learning a language. And in the end, uh, the data structure teaching, I think, took a hit because of that. And I think it's a bit similar to what we see in Erlang, and I like to call that the compounded hardships. This is the Spruce Goose. It's a really cool plane uh, that was designed in World War II in an attempt to carry cargo across the Atlantic without using aluminum because of the uh, war efforts. So the resulting thing is that it was not a plane. It turned out to be a plane boat with the largest wingspan in history. It flew once after the, after the war, was not shipped on time. And mostly it's a relic of kind of crazy ideas. But I think Erlang is a bit like that. Just building a plane, which is the system we want to build, is already a challenge in itself. When we build it in Erlang, one of the things that happens is that when you have to play with all that uh, weird integration tooling and all the other difficulties, like the basic stuff is going to be the syntax, which is fine. Um, you're going to have functional programming, recursion, pattern matching, uh, concurrency, functional data structures, immutability, all that kind of stuff is already hard. And when you get in there and give the experience of a harder or more difficult environment to play with, that's a compounded hardship. And so people in this room are probably very good at building wooden airplanes, but most people just want to build an airplane. They don't want the challenge of make, making them out of birch wood uh, the same way that the spruce goose was made. And so what I think happens is that we have grown a kind of tolerance in there. If you ask people uh, like Joe Armstrong how programming was back in the day, he's going to give you really, really cool stories about uh, needing to write everything on paper or maybe to punch cards, sending that to university department. They would compile that, run them for you. And after a few weeks, you might get the result back. And that was maybe just a compile or parser or the equivalent of that. And then he learned to break up the task in multiple parts and running Writing and running a program was a thing that, could, that, that took multiple weeks. And so by comparison, what we have today is extremely amazing and extremely awesome. Uh, but the idea that we have that reference point in the past is one of the things that makes us accept a subpar experience, I think. And I'm not singling out Joe in there because I'm doing exactly the same. Uh, and I'm mostly, I've grown in the Erlang system and we got used to it. And the uh, kind of nefarious thing in there I believe, is that this community as a whole gets used to that subpar experience and it becomes a kind of a rite of passage or maybe it's the way we perceive it without realizing it. And the thing with that is that you have an entire community who is fine with that difficult tooling, that difficult experience, that learning curve that we have, and mostly ignore it because everyone who is using Erlang day-to-day -day has had to go through with that and has that capacity and we forget about everyone who is not able to do it. And so to, to give an example of that in action, I want to go through the kind of history of the Erlang build and dependency tools. Uh, we have fantastic tools for testing everything like that. Build tool dependency tools, I think they're pretty bad and I'm working on one of them. So in 86, Erlang was created. It was that kind of prologue-y weird thing. There's one paper out there that you can read about that. I had no idea how it was built. And then from the 90s to the 2000s, it was mostly make files. There was no way to get dependencies. You mostly install them somewhere in your system, put them in Erlibs, and then try to build a thing, and maybe it would work. Now, there's been a few other systems in between, Sinon, other ones. There's stuff that's been made in Elixir. I've not included them. But in 2010, um, Rebar came around. And that one was a big change because it added dependency management. It was an Erlang, configured an Erlang term. And really, stuff uh, in this community really exploded at that point because it was easy to share code, easy to deal with it, 
and uh, really to publish and share what you had. And that was a big improvement. Uh, Rebar, however, really showed its age sooner than later, and Erlang.mk was written to replace it. Erlang.mk uh, is, of course, a bunch of make files. So we did have uh, Rebar, which was make files in Erlang, and Erlang.mk, which is Rebar in make files. So make files and make files. Uh, it, it was faster, added and index uh, was direly needed, and we recently got Rebar 3 out in a stable version, which has package management. So in 30 years of tool making, really what we've done is make files, Erlang, make files, Erlang. We've got package management, but not really. We just borrowed the entire infrastructure of Elixir. And even though Erlang people have that really big propension of saying we had that 25 years ago, concurrency 25 years ago, uh, reactive programming 25 years ago, and all these things 25 years ago, good tooling, we, re we really, really never had it in terms of bettering the workflow of people. And languages like Elixir or Go that are five years or so in terms of age, zoom past us in, I, I, even if we had 30 years or five, 25 years of head start. Uh, there, there's a lot of good stuff in there, packages, by Erlang solution, and everything like that. But really, we don't have a lot to show for for that 25 years head start we've had. And so I think that it's because we've become insensitive as a group. And the analogy I want to use for that one is the one of boiled frog. If you've never heard of that one, is that if you put a, uh, a frog in boiling water, it's just going to jump out and avoid dying. If you put one into cold water and slowly warm it up to a boiling point, the frog is going to die. Now, actual experiments have proven that frogs just get out of warm water no matter what. They don't really care about that. But I think it's still a good analogy, so let's pretend it's true. Uh, the, the relative temperatures in this community, I think, are going to be about the ease of learning of using Erlang in day-to-day -day tasks. And so when we just take our time and do all these little hacks that we have every day on the command line to make stuff a bit faster, or in whatever kind of tooling, everything that is suboptimal, that's relative temperature growing in this company compared to other languages where you get started. If you've ever tried a language like Elm, which is totally for front-end applications and, uh, and that kind of stuff, but they have fantastic compiler warning, uh, you can get going in 10 minutes if you've never used it. It's a tiny package. You just run it, and everything works. So that one, for example, uh, people coming from Elm going into Erlang would be in a very hot bath by comparison. And the problem is that people maintaining, running, writing systems are completely critical to higher reliability. And so all of the technical stuff that we develop to have safer languages, better systems, and stuff like that is entirely useless if we don't have people to maintain them. And if we just keep letting the relative temperature of this community grow, by inaction and having less than optimal workflows, we're just going to get ourselves in trouble where uh, there is nobody to maintain what we do. And so I think we have to be aware of that insensitivity that I think is already there uh, within everyone in here. And one of the right attitudes I want to have uh, there is Garrett Smith. You might not be able to read that. At some point, Garrett Smith wanted to help Tristan and myself uh, with Rebar Tree in terms of printing better messages re regarding path. And we're telling him like how to rerun the project. It's like you call bootstrap and everything. Gary is like, 10 seconds? Do you have time to read comics during that operation? It's like, that's the right attitude to have. I didn't realize it. Um, we're just, we did have a better command at 10 times faster. But just like repeating to Garrett, that's the way I know how to do it. It takes 10 seconds. You run it. That's what you do. And no, I think Garrett has the right attitude of calling bullshit on these kind of things where really there is a better solution to be had. And if there is not, we must have a good reason for it. So every time there's the kind of tiny frustration we have with the system, we should be able to work to fix that. And I want to show that this works, this is possible. Uh, we've done it multiple times in this community, at least in terms of tutorials and everything like that. But we have more work to do. So when I joined the community close to six, seven years ago or something, everyone on IRC and whatnot were asking, like, how do I run code out of the shell? And that was really a kind of tricky one, because nothing really told you how to do it. Every tutorial we were doing were just compiling in the Erlang shell with the little C function call and then the L function call, and you run everything, and there's no way to run anything outside. So I decided to go dive into the programming books in Erlang that we have. Joe Armstrong's book, First Edition, doesn't tell you how to run code outside of the shell until page 113 in chapter 6. 
Uh, Francesco and Simon's book with O'Reilly didn't tell you how to do it until page 289 in chapter 12. Let me some realize my own book that doesn't do it before page 120 in chapter 8. The KNR book in C2008 edition tells you how to do it in page 6. So really, how come we didn't have a better experience in there? Uh, you have to learn the entire language before you're able to even run a program, show it to someone, install it somewhere, display it, uh, without some really, really janky invocations. And that's pretty bad, but it, it got resolved with time. We got the thing going, and right now, pretty much nobody asked a question. You're going to know about eScripts fast enough, or are you even going to build a release really quickly? After that, the big question became, what is OTP? And everyone had this kind of bunch of modules randomly scattered in a directory with no dependency, because nobody had dependency management tools. And you saw that thing where everyone told you the fancy airline people in big corporations are using OTP. They have that stuff that's really there. You looked at the documentation, nobody really knew how that worked. <clears throat> and it was a bit of a problem. Eventually, there were blog posts, websites helping, uh, books and everything like that, and things really got better. And now most people know about OTP. And it's important, they know about it within the first week or even within the first day. <clears throat> The next big question was, how do I build a release? And really, uh, even today, that, not, that one is not that easy. If you go look into the OTP documentation and you look at target system, there's stuff in there that looks like black magic. I still don't know if that page of documentation has to do with an actual tool or something. It's just a definition of a structure. It's not very clear. And back then, you had to work with SysTool. You had to work with RHEL tool. It was that big, big, scary thing. And for the longest time, what everyone would do is just copy-paste that rel tool configuration from a rebar.config or someone would build a config, put into their project, and hope it worked for them. And if it didn't, it's like, well, screw that. I'm going to run this in a screen session or something. And that was not a great way. Uh, eventually, uh, Tristan Slaughter and Jordan Wilmer uh, took stuff out of Sinan, which were the build tool, and made Relics out of it. And now Relics really makes releases easy. Everyone in Erlang uses it. Every tool in Elixir seems to be built around it. And people can build releases within a day or so. But we went from what was maybe a year, a year and a half before you use your first releases to being able to do it within the first week of learning the language. And that's been a great improvement that we've had, and there's a lot more we can do. Right now, a lot of the frequently asked questions we have are probably, how do I do real ops? Uh, that's really hard. The stories from Ericsson is just like, you test the live code update as much as the real regular code, all that kind of stuff. Nobody really knows how to do it. XRM and Elixir does it. There's plugins to do it in Rebar 3. I think they need to be discovered. But we're starting to get solutions there, which back then were just like, it's so much effort, don't even try. And now it should be a thing that really soon, I think, will get into the workflow of everyone. That's a great improvement. How do I make my own hex mirror? And that one is interesting because it's a problem both in Elixir and in Erlang. Um, and the other interesting thing is that if we looked at releases in OTP, it's just like the big corporate people are doing that. How do I do it at home? How do I make my own hex mirror is the opposite problem. It's big corporate people going, hi, I have a server that doesn't talk to the internet. How do I build a project my developers want to build? And we're seeing a reversal in there that I think is pretty cool, where the open source efforts are, try are starting to really take over the Ericsson-led efforts in terms of toolings and that kind of stuff for the workflow we have. And that has to keep going on, but we have to be conscious about that. And then we don't really know what is next. So. I think a night with Erlang, uh, back in the day, the, the Joe Armstrong experience, if you let me call it that way, of sending punch cards and everything, was just kind of making your bed camp, making your own fire in the woods. And then at 5 in the morning, you have to get up to pee, and then the fire is off, and everything is wet, and it's terrible. Just great camping experience. Everyone loves that. A night with Erlang is probably a bit more like that. It's a pop-up camper. You just have to build it. It's everything. It's much nicer. It's still close to nature, but you have a toilet. You might even have a shower. You have a place to cook. It's much nicer. Um, who came to this conference and slept in that? Nobody. But it's so nice. It's the Erlang experience. Now, most people pick something like that. This is Hotel NO uh, 1642. That's the one that I think was recommended for this venue. And so most people came here and slept in a hotel in a bed that was pre-made. You don't need to build your bed every night. No reason to do that. And I think that's really the experience we should be aiming to have in Erlang. Like, there's no reason I'm building my own system from scratch and assembling my own bed and my own bed stand and my own bedroom and building my own alarm clock every morning or every night with Erlang. It should really be a thing like that. 
We want to learn Erlang to solve a problem, and right now, in a lot of areas, Erlang is the problem we have to solve. That's not a good thing. And so how could things be? How things could be? How to get there? There's a few broad ideas. There is no quick fix. <laughs> I think, yeah. That's an Erlang programmer in the making. Um, I think we have to really stop with the quick fixes. And by that, I mean everyone has or has had a project where what you carry around is a make file, where you just put all the little quirks that you correct for every one of the tools. And then when you move from project to project, the make file gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you have a library where you have to make a patch, you fork it to your own GitHub repository or user, then you make the patch there and you leave it there and you move on. And so what we're creating like that is just someone who at the start has a tiny tool belt, which we just fill and fill and fill every day until it's something that weighs like 100 kilograms or something like that. And it's very hard. And someone starting a language for the first time or just joining your team for the first time has to wear the 100 kilogram tool belt for the first time. It's very heavy, it's very uncomfortable, and you just leave. You don't want to boil in that water. And so the, the, the culture of quick fixes has to end, where if we do the same thing two or three times, really, we should really start a discussion about how can we fix that more permanently, have a way that is not so manual every time, and stop carrying that burden of everything. Send fixes upstream. If the person upstream is not responsive, we're going to have to really start a discussion about the forks and everything like that. And I think hex is going to be interesting there because you cannot have 150 forks of a database driver on hex with just like a number after the end. We're going to have to start doing that stuff a bit more cleverly than what we've done for the, the, the past multiple years. It's going to be a good thing, but really about the everyday workflow. You have someone joining your team, they're struggling. I want people to take note of that and start thinking about solutions for that. It is going to come and pay us back in multiple ways. We should be making the tools shine. And this is maybe a bit more for people writing tutorials, writing guides, but it's about really anything we do. I think it's a general mindset. Uh, the really awesome stuff with Erlang is going to be, yes, the programming model. It's going to be, yes, OTP, but it's going to be tracing. It's going to be property-based testing. It's going to be the community, the libraries, the kind of mindset you have where academia meets the industry, and you have really, really clever people that making lists in the chat rooms that do fancy stuff on the edge of research. And that's a very, very valuable thing. But every time we learn Erlang, we've all done that little exercise where we build a database with the recursive functions that you call with C, my DB, and then you run it there and you see the database and say, cool, I wrote a database that I'm never going to use ever again. How cool would it be that we would have instead an exercise where within a day, we build a database that's based on CRDT libraries that type checks through Dialyzer and has property-based tests? Like, it would be pretty cool. Uh, right now, it seems impossible. I think most people here don't even have uh, a property-based test testing suite or something like that, right? And it, it could be really an interesting approach to take. How do we get there? That's really a good challenge. Uh, but part of it is making your own tools shine, I think. Everyone here who is writing a library is using a library has seen the uh, frustrating parts of that. First thing a library should have is really the simple documentation. Tell me what the library does, why should I care, how should I use it, when I should use it, and where to look for more information. If you're not able to answer these uh, four or five questions, you're not giving any hope to newcomers. Just getting to that GitHub page where the only thing you see is a readme, that's the default template, and the library doing that, build it with rebar 3 compile or make, it, it, it's just garbage, and it's, I think, a lack of respect to your users. So yeah, what it does, why I should care, how I should use it, when I should use it, and where to look for more information. If you're nice, you're going to want to have a few examples in there telling people how it runs, what the output should look like. Uh, if you have time and regular users, you might want at that point to have a reference manual, which means that's where you get eDoc and that kind of stuff going, so that if I have an idea of how to use things, just want to dig a, a little bit more and stuff like that, I'm able to get the information I need. I'm able to look at things, and if I just have um, a hole in my memory where I don't remember what a function argument is like, I could go and find it there. And then if you really have more time and you have enough users, you can tell me how to help you. What's your timeline? What are the features that we're missing? 
what do you need help with? What standards do you enforce? And if you have that, then I should have to look at your source code. But before then, if the solution is look at the source, you're, you're just giving people a terrible experience. Shouldn't be how to have. So th that's really it for the basic documentation. But there's a, a lot of stuff that we have to do there otherwise. Um, how do I find your library? You need to have visibility. GitHub is a terrible place for visibility. Have you used GitHub search? It is pretty bad. You're looking for code, and you're going to find code, but not the code you want. Uh, you might want to search for Google. You're going to find 25 forks. They all have different patch levels. You don't know what you get. Put your library on hex. It's at least it's not a perfect system. It's the best one we have right now. Hopefully, even something nicer will come through. But Hex is a really, really good thing to have. There's a central link for the library. You can search through them. You can put your links to documentation in there. People are going to find it. It's going to be much, much, much nicer. All the dependencies are going to be stored there. There's not going to be problems with that. Uh, you might want to make Twitter mailing lists Slack announcements so that there is common knowledge being built about your library being in the wild. If you don't do it, you just dump it on GitHub. Nobody's never going to be using it. Uh, another interesting practice, whenever you get questions about this, take note of them. And that becomes your documentation as you answer them. If you just get the questions going and you never know them down, you're just forcing yourself to repeat it to everyone every time. And it's going to be terrible for you because it's a loss of time. It's going to be terrible for your users because they have to go find you to know how it goes. And that means that nobody else can maintain the library but you because you're the only one having persistent knowledge of everything in there. Bad practice. Uh, Documentation might be published. There's tools to publish documentation out there. There's the Earl Docs website that lets you fetch it. There's even one that goes with Hex that comes with it, but nobody uses it, at least on the airline side of thing. Elixir people do it fine. That one is good. Airline, we don't care. I don't even do it myself. Uh, I should. And really, I think one of the big points is that it should be fun. Right now, learning Erlang is an investment. You have to set aside two or three weeks. You have to buy a book, so it's not just a time investment. It's also a monetary investment. And then you have to go dig down and play with it. And you don't play with it. You work through it until you get to a point where you think, OK, that's how I put a system together. I'm able to deploy it. I'm able to do something with it. But for the longest time, you're alone in the little book universe of just doing the basic stuff, and almost not using any community tools, just learning what the hell Erlang is. And then you get out there after three weeks, a month of learning, and you go into IRC or Slack or something like that, or Twitter is just like, hey, what's a good project in Erlang? It's like, I mean, that, that's not a question you want to hear. The reason you have that question is that someone is done going through the book. They don't feel they have a way to learn by themselves. And they now ask people around there, what more should I learn? How do I learn something actually real with this? And they don't do it before. Um, I, I think that points to a cruel lack of self-directed learning experience in Erlang. Everything we do, I think, is still, I, I want to say old school, where it's someone in front of them telling them what to do a bit, what I'm doing right now, but really just telling them, this is what you learn now. This is what you learn tomorrow. This is the exercises to go through. Now go free in the wild. That's not cool. Really, uh, the best way to do it is to get someone the basic tools to do what they want in the environment that lets them want to explore and play with it and have fun with it. And that's really when they're going to have a better time learning Erlang. And I, I think the indirect result of that today is that when you look at the Erlang learning experience, there's really a lot of people learning late in their careers. And when you, t you see an interview about a company using Erlang, they're going to say something like, it's really the only tool that could do the job. And that's cool. That's cool. You're the only piece of technology that's able to do what they really need doing. The problem is that this is the last man on Earth kind of strategy, right? It's just, it's really cool. Nothing else could do it, so I had no choice to learn Erlang. That's the way a lot of people do it, and we're proud of that. It shouldn't. It should be fun. Erlang should be a thing that you do, you explore in, you play with, and at some point you just never regret making that decision because it is the only thing that can do its thing, but that's not a factor. You choose it because you wanted it to be fun and you wanted to use it. So um, I want to try a thing. Uh, OK, Mary displays. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, how do I send that here? OK, I'm going to make it a bit bigger. So I've put together a thing that's just really, oh, I don't see my cursor or everything. Cool. 
Just really a basic project. Can people read that fine? I need to make it bigger. Show of hands. Bigger? <sighs> you people with terrible eyesight. I blame you all for the problems of my lack of preparation. A second. Bigger again? Show of hands bigger? Yeah, people at the back. I could ask you to come closer, but that's, I think, counterintuitive as a solution. I'll just make it somewhat bigger again. Oh, it's so small on the screen here, too. There we go. OK, so what I have here is a file that's just a regular rebar config with a plugin. I, I don't really care where the source is for that one. I'm writing it. And it, it's a crud project, really. It's create, read, update, delete APIs. It's super boring. We should have a framework for that. Uh, we have Cowboy, but I don't believe it to be a framework at that point. It's more of a library or a toolkit. So I made a template in there that's going to run the thing. Rebar 3, new crud project. It's going to fetch it. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be fast enough. OK. So it compiled the thing. If I go into the readme file, I'm going to have, how do you create a new handler resource? You do this, and then you're going to have a little file to put in a readme. So I'm going to run this little command. And I have a CRUD handler called my resource. going to take a little while to run. Oh, that's faster than home. Good network, Sweden. <laughs> so uh, if I go in there, there's a bunch of files that have been written. If I go into my resource model in there, let me just actually shrink that one this way. Jesus, this is small. There we go. So what I have is a really basic handler in there where I get the definition about what code path I want it to have. It's a simple thing. That's a, a thing a, a framework would give you. Uh, I have init function, terminate, validate, create, read, update, delete. And that's the end of it. If I just go to the thing and, uh, oh, that's the part that takes a bit longer, I guess. Yeah, it's not your network. It's me not knowing my demo well enough. It might be your network as well. So packages are, small, are, are a bit faster, but yeah. And so I want to, again, while this build, reiterate that the really important point, I think, is not that this is a framework. Uh, this should be done by a framework. It's not a tool for CRUD. It's a, it's a tool to show what we can do with Erlang instead, uh, how it could be easy, and right now, Building that thing and just picking the libraries and everything that goes in there took me multiple hours. And I'm going to show you in 10, 15 minutes what it can do. So I'm just going to boot it with the shell because I'm not, it builds a release, but oh, I'm typing bad. All right, I'm booting the shell. And what I'm going to have is the application is started. It uses the same stuff as releases. Um, where's my cursor? If I go to that website, we have automatically generated documentation for. Oh, I don't, because I forgot to listen to my own instruction. I have to open um, the router file and add my resource model in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart it, actually, because I think I haven't set that stuff right. OK, now it runs. Uh, where's my other tab? There we go. I have API docs for, and that's going to be small, but I don't know that I can, yeah, make it bigger and unreadable. So delete operations, get operations right now. I want to try them. Try it out. It tells me there's a 404. I want to post the content instead. Uh, yes, try it out. The content has been written in there. The API is being tested. That's existing tools. I wrote none of that. It's really. Not a big thing, it's just that you have a quick way to test it. What we see in the background happen is that we have colored logs coming with it. You have errors and everything, logging is taking care of you. Showing lagger right now, cool. We have lagger, it's being pre-configured for everything I need. Um, other cool stuff we might have in that one is that if I do rebar three check, which is an alias for commands, and, oh, shoo, compiling a PLT. Um, actually, I have a faster one going, because I knew that would be a problem. There we go. I think that one is pre-compiled, preparing for a list of networks. Yeah, OK, so that one is not being used right now. There's probably a file missing or something. Uh, let's go back to 
I prepared, but not that well. Okay. Rebar 3 check. We're going to wade through that little thing. Does anyone have interesting stories and blah, blah, blah? Should it be that long? It's much faster than it was. And really, uh, what we have, you're already seeing there, the cross-reference analysis already took place on the third line of the execution. So Xref does a quick check. Um, we do have dialyzer going in because everything that we could see in there is already, where's my cursor for the mouse? There. Everything is already type checked for that one. And if really I open something like in my models, I go to, uh, not my models, I want to go to my backends because I decided to use non standard directory. That's an A. Mamstore, the Earl. What we have there is the super fun exercise that we have by default everywhere with little databases and it's being tested. Oh, there we go, it executed on the side. Property based tests got there. It's testing CRUD operations. Create, read, delete, delete. There's no reason for me to ever write that freaking test. It's the same for every single library you have out there. The tests are generated and I get fancy code coverage with them. Um, getting me with my resource model is covered 100%. The router module is covered 100%. Overall, I get 80% coverage without having done anything. And I have an API that I've shown you is working. I have tests. I have everything like that. It type checks. There's no stuff being broken. And, and so this would be pretty cool, but I think there's like more stuff in there. Everything we have to do has to have some form of monitoring. So why not use the cool libraries we have in there? Uh, let me search a different thing for that one. It's a different port number. It's uh, five, five, six, five. Yeah. So I have a lot of resources in there. Yeah. Is that, oh, I killed the app, champion me. Uh, Rebar 3 shell, run the stupid app. We don't need the output in there. Okay, no metrics for that one. That's normal because I haven't run a single call. Let me go in there. I'm gonna run my post message again. Try it out, try it out, try it out. I got a bunch of log messages. And now I have statistics and metrics that are ready to be consumed. And all of that kind of stuff is really stuff everyone here knows you're going to need. You're going to need metrics. You're going to need documentation. You're going to need all of that. It's terrible that we have to build it all by hand, even if we have fancy frameworks and fancy tools. It's all done for you automatically based on the properties that a CRUD app is always the same stupid boring thing. It's, uh, it, it, it's a skin on top of a database. And so that's really one way to get it going. Uh, but what's interesting is that in working to try to make this integration and the tool shine, where I want to show Lagger, I want to show Dialyzer, I want to show property-based testing, and all the tests are running for you automatically of being written already, I make an environment that's better for me as an experienced Erlang developer. But it gets really cool if I want to actually work with someone uh, running tutorials in there. So I made a little tutorial namespace command. There's a CRUD tutorial. It, can people read down there or want me to bring it a bit higher in there? Higher. There we go. We have the little thing there. Hello, this is a tutorial for basic online using CRUD, blah, blah, blah. Add a new thing. We're going to store a fridge handler. Cool, cool, cool. I love fridges. Creating the thing. I'm going to go back in that one. Reopen the router that I have. I'm just going to add my fridge handler. And now I'm going to run the tutorial again. And the thing it's going to do is that it's able to use a test. Oh, yeah, I just added the thing. That's fine. I rerun the tutorial. And it's able to look in the project because it's uh, really oh standard structure. Why is it not there? Fridge model should be there. Oh, I called it fridge handler. You see, my tutorial is catching my errors. So I don't have to care about that. It's doing it for me. It's added in there. So, oh, we have the exercise database thingy. A deleted database gives me the specification I have to implement it. That's a tutorial everyone has been doing for years. I don't care. I saved it before. Yes, I want to write to the file. I don't want to write it all in front of you. That's boring. When I run it again, the tutorial is now able to use the common structure I have with the tool to run property-based tests and see, yes, your database implementation is actually correct. You don't have to run this garbage in the shell again, just saying, oh, yeah, I'm adding stuff to a list, don't know what to do. Once you're done with that kind of project, you actually can just move forward. You have an environment, a website you can deploy. You can put that somewhere. Everyone can play with it. But it's the same boring exercise we always do, except that time it's done in a much nicer context. I know what the community tools are. I know where to move forward. And someone can easily glue something in there about making the same tutorial, but for um, really property-based testing. And so if I do have my thing there and I had the, uh, what was the other one called, recipe, 
model because I'm going to store recipes and stuff like that. And then I could have a thing that, oh, I'm still adding it. I could have a thing that really asks me to recommend our, uh, food that I have in the fridge to make a meal and all the recommendation systems. There's a really clear path forward for self-learning. I show all the tools. And the overall experience, I think, is much nicer for everyone using the project. And if you want to modify stuff, it's still the same airline code we would have written ourselves. So really, I think um, that's what I wanted to show for this little demo. It's an idea. It's not a final thing, really. It's a proof of concept. Uh, we should have something nicer, I think, overall. Uh, but I'm interested in finding solutions. If you're interested in finding solutions, also you can come and see me or just experiment on your own. I think there's uh, really cool stuff to be done and uh, much better improvements to be had into our everyday workflow that we have. Thank you. Any questions or point of discussion, something like that? No questions. Was it that boring? All right, then. Oh, you do have questions. I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, there's one there. Yes. Yeah, I'll repeat the questions. Who? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, who's going to pay for that? We're fine with writing the libraries, deploying them, uh, but then maintaining them, putting them in good condition, writing documentation, who's going to pay for that? And I'm going to say that uh, who's going to pay for that if you don't do it? And it's going to be you, of course, because when you train new people coming on your team, you onboard people to your workflow, you're going to be the one having to train them. Either that or you're going to give them a terrible experience where you drop them into a big repository and tell them, this is how we work here, figure it out. Like, the investment of doing it comes back to everyone working on it, and the investment of not doing it comes back to everyone not working on it, or at that point working on it, because you're still the, pe the person who knows about that stuff. So if someone has a question, they're going to come back to you anyway. Um, really, if you have to teach that thing to more than one person, it's going to be faster to write it down and have them read it and answer maybe one question instead of 15 of them over the course of multiple weeks of training. Um, I think that's the shift in mindset we have to have. Um, it's really great how fewer people talk to me now that I write more documentation. Next question. Uh, the tools for that, there's eDoc in there. I think eDoc needs a facelift. I think everyone thinks that also. Uh, I don't know who is going to take the responsibility about that. If you feel like you're looking for a project to do, that's a cool thing to do. But really, documentation in there, uh, I just put a readme file in the GitHub repo, and then in the hex page, you put a link there, and people are going to click the source link, see the readme. Like the, the five questions of what, who, where, the, when, and that kind of stuff uh, really fits in a readme. It takes half a page to answer. It's not super long. And otherwise, if you're just using eDoc for documentation and code, it generates the thing for you, and you can upload it on the websites for that. Earl Docs is one of them that generates them for you. And I think there's docs.hex.pm that hosts them for, the, for you also if you make a package. So like the infrastructure is mostly already in place. We're just not using it out of laziness, I think, or ignorance, either of these. I don't think anyone here is doing malice. So I'm going to write a super useful tool, but tell nobody about it. They're going to be suckers for that. I don't think that happens. Questions for Fred? Anyone? If you want questions about one JavaScript. One more question before we dismiss. Yeah. That's the rule. If you have JavaScript question, I just come back from a JavaScript conference. That's right. Where's your hat? Uh, it's behind the stage. So uh, Fred, um, how have you found support amongst you? You so Fred is championing this. I mean, he he and Tristan on the rebar front is, have been doing an incredible job, and this is tough work. And it's based on a vision, I think, of, of making this generally accessible to build community. It, it's based on shame. It's based uh, on shame. Yeah, so if I go back to the beginning out there and, uh, what's that one? That thing? 
That's because I had this happening with like five, six, ten different people trying it. That at some point, it's just feeling like a clown showing them a tool I want them to use to work with me, and them just going, ah, that's terrible. Like at some point, that's why I don't actually enjoy working on Rebar 3. I hope someone makes a better tool so I don't have to do it anymore. But I like working on it more than I hate seeing people just looking at me weird about why the hell do you use that shitty tooling. And so f for me, that's really the big point. I, I just got fed up of not being able to find coworkers on a bunch of things because they felt the tooling experience was subpar compared to other languages. And that's how I got involved into that one. For other people, I think there might be nicer motivations than just getting people to stop complaining. <laughs> So, 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 how have you? Have, have, are you able to recruit people in this effort, though? I mean, I think yeah, you, you, you. yeah, we have. I mean, we we now have a new core committer on uh, Rebar three, which is Alistair Sullivan, and we're getting more and more uh, open contributions from people. And I think part of that effort is also one of the things we can do better, which is when someone opens an issue. Uh, one of the approaches to take, instead of just like, ah, I'm going to fix that in two weeks or something, is just, here's how I think it could be fixed. Can you please help us do that? And really onboard people into helping you into your project. If you as a project owner kind of maintain that authority of, uh, I'm doing everything, I know what I'm doing, let me do it, I'm going to do it better, you're never going to get help. And it's about changing the attitude and the openness you have in people approaching you with comments and with help and giving them guidelines. And really, I think the idea is to become an enabler of people helping you fix the tools rather than just someone who does all the work for them for free. And at that point, I think it does change the perspective a bit, and we're trying to get more and more help. And there's a bunch of tasks. If people want to work on Rebar 3 or something like that. There's a, a few tasks labeled for beginners. Otherwise, you can ask us. But I think the same stuff is going on with Mix in the Elixir community and stuff like that. So multiple projects are looking for people. If you have a bit of a hole in your schedule, just want to know how the, the sausage is made, uh, it's probably a decent way to get through it. Any other questions? Let's round of applause for, for Fred Eber. Right.